fighting climate change, saving the world from catastrophe? In the interview this week, the winner of the 1995 Nobel Prize for Chemistry, Mario Molina. Professor Molina, you have discovered the depletion of the ozone layer. You have also consistently warned about the impact of climate change. How is the situation at the moment? Are you still worried about climate change? Yes, very much so. Because in contrast to the uh, ozone layer, which is a problem that society actually solved, there's an international agreement so that the industrial compounds that <clears throat> that affect the ozone layer are no longer being manufactured. With climate change, we're very far from, from a solution. It's, of course, difficult because it involves the use of energy from fossil fuels and society still using them extensively. So we know that we, we have a serious problem, but we know it can be solved. It's just that uh, we haven't started to do that. What actually triggered your in-depth studies? What started it? It was really... Um, originally my involvement with the stratospheric ozone that got me to work with global problems and we have clearly human activities are causing problems on a global scale because they affect the atmosphere and when you emit compounds that remain there for a few months or longer then it doesn't matter anymore where you emit them it's completely a global issue and that's why the entire planet needs to work to solve it. But some critics say that the effects or the impacts of climate change are overstated. What do you reply to these people? Oh, here is the situation. Uh, it was particularly in the United States, there was a very clever, very well-funded campaign to discredit climate science. Yeah. And it was from powerful interest groups. And they were very successful. In contrast, the scientific community, we were very shy. We, we were not making any uh, press releases or talking to the press. Probably scientists are a bit too shy and not using the media enough, or what do you think? Yes, that it, it's uh, very much the case. The scientists are very shy. Normally, they think it's up to somebody else to deal with the media or to do this. Uh, <laughs> Uh, public information issues, but I think that's a mistake. We, that's something we did learn with stratospheric ozone. And we can remain honest, we don't have to exaggerate, and we, we can divide issues as follows. Science doesn't tell society what to do. Mm -hmm. It only tells society what happens if you do something or other. But as an individual, I can have an opinion what needs to be done, because I also have values I want society to improve and so on. So as long as I separate science from policy, it's fine. And there are also very important economic issues. Mm. All needs to be taken together. But can one really separate science from policy? Doesn't your research have a political impact in the end, you know? Yes, the, the impact is political because we try to answer the right questions. Namely, what are the consequences of our activities or can we change so that the consequences are different? And then, of course, with economists, how much would that cost? And with uh, knowing with uh, policymakers, what would it take? What measures need to be taken? And in the end, for these global issues, we believe it's important that there are government interventions. It cannot be solved just voluntarily. But that makes it even more difficult. Government interventions and also kind of global intervention, intervention correct? That's correct, that's yeah. correct. Do you really feel that things are changing nowadays well, regarding climate change? Regarding climate change, we think they are changing, but too slowly. Uh, the, uh, Europe is a good example. They, they are leaders in this field and they have taken measures uh, that really address the problem such as financing alternative energy sources like wind energy or solar. Germany is, of course, a leader here with very important uh, results, namely the price, the cost of these alternative energies is coming down very fast so that it is a real alternative. And that's what it takes. It takes leadership 
but as long as the rest of the planet doesn't mm. participate, uh, fossil fuel energy is still cheaper. It's just that the cost of the damage is not being incorporated. It's what we call a market failure yeah. because it, it's mm. not all the costs are in there. No? Now looking at Germany, at Germany, do you think Germany can play a kind of role model for Europe or even for the world in investing much more than other countries into renewable energy? I, I think uh, that's certainly the case. Uh, Germany is already playing the role model. It's amazing the amount of solar energy that is used in Germany, even though G Germany doesn't have as much sun, say, as Mexico or so. Yes. <laughs> But there again, the price is coming down fast. And so uh, China is another example of a country that is uh, that has a vision that they want to be able to be in the market to sell these new green technologies. Because the most likely thing, if, if we have to talk about uh, uh, betting on something, the most likely thing is that the problem is going to get worse and society will change. And so the countries that start first will be the ones that will be better off because they will be already on the path to this change that society needs to carry out. But talking about China, China is the biggest CO2 emitter at the moment and it's growing economically quite fastly. Isn't that a problem? It, it is certainly a problem. For China has, for example, a five-year program and they have commitments which they are very serious about. And so what they are doing is reducing the amount of energy needed per unit productivity. That's, that's called the energy intensity. So they're improving that. But their economy is still growing so fast that their emissions actually are increasing. If they're just not increasing as fast as they yeah. would if they didn't care about it. Mm. So they're still building some uh, coal-fired power plants and that's something that even the central government is not quite in agreement with, but they have to let it happen for the economy to grow. So it's a complicated system, but at least it's an example of, a, of an emerging economy that is indeed very seriously mm. considering this problem because it affects them as well. In, in the end, it will mm. cost them more to deal with the changes in their climate, droughts and agriculture and mm. floods. So that's very costly. But economic growth and combating climate change, does it really do go together? It, what is very clear is that they don't compete. If you do a clever economic growth and you do it with the right incentives and with the right technologies, the growth is actually faster. Now, it's a matter also of, of a, a, a time scale because there is no doubt that in the long run, it, it, all the countries will suffer if the climate really changes dramatically. Which countries from your, or which areas in the world will be affected mostly by climate change from your point of view? Well, it turns out the, the consensus is that perhaps it's some developing countries, some of the poor countries that will suffer more because they have less resources to change, to adapt, so they might have to have some uh, large immigration policies, for example, or uh, coastal areas will suffer in a way that it's, it's, it's going to be very difficult to deal with. Mm. But uh, even countries like the United States with massive forest fires and, and so on, even such countries, they can deal with it, but it will cost them more than if they would participate in a solution. But do you feel a change in the way governments are handling climate change or are they more sensible towards the impacts nowadays? There, is, there are two sides to it. Yes, countries like Europe, countries like Mexico, even Brazil and so on, there is a, a, a better understanding that something needs to happen. In the United States, it happens like states like California are very forward looking. But unfortunately, there are very serious internal political problems because the Republican Party uh, has taken as, as, as their point of view that climate change science is not valid. Mm. I think that's temporary because it doesn't make sense in the United States to dismiss science, which has been so crucial for their own development. So we think that's something unusual, something temporary, an extreme point of view driven by also the economic crisis. 
But uh, talking to a number of uh, Republican politicians, we, we can see that th th this will probably change in the next few years. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's absolutely essential that the United States changes, otherwise there will be no international mm -hmm. agreement. Being a Nobel laureate, do you have the feeling people listen to you more than to others? Fortunately, yes, we have access to even heads of state on, on many occasions. So it's what we call convening power that we can take advantage of if we do the right job. That's why we have to be very cautious. We don't exaggerate. We, being that cautious, we can actually take advantage of this uh, uh, fact that uh, we can talk to very high level politicians but we have to learn that something not all of us have learned to do very well to communicate very clearly mm -hmm. uh, because that's not easy. Mm -hmm. Mm. Now um, you've combated climate change for many many years as a scientist and uh, are warning about have been warning about it. Now what's your outlook for the future? The outlook for the future, I think, I am an optimist. We probably have to be patient for a few years for this. One crucial issue is the following. The climate is complex, so we have to explain that we're talking about a risk probabilities. We're not absolutely certain, but it is just the risk is very, very clear. And that's difficult to communicate to society. So mm. Unless you know exactly what's going to happen, don't bother me. That doesn't happen with <laughs> medicine or with yeah. fire insurance and okay. so on. But we haven't been able to communicate that very clearly. Professor Molina, thank you very much. I'm very glad to be in your program. Thank you.